Welcome to the wide world of esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Nor. Today, our topic is esports risk management, keeping your event safe. With me is Angela Hazlett, my partner in Nor Sports Risk Management and the host of the Sports Playbook. Welcome, Angela. Kathy, I am so excited to join you and talk about a subject I know we're both passionate about, which is risk management, such an important topic. So thank you for having me join your show. All right. Every event director should pay attention to this. I hope that if you put on events that you will uh, pay close attention to this show and adhere to what we tell you about. And uh, you know, this is only a half hour show, so there's a lot more to learn about. And uh, I actually published a, a textbook called Managing Risk in Sport and Recreation, The Essential Guide to Loss Prevention. Unfortunately, it was published before I got involved in esports and probably before the word esports was even used. Um, but anyway, we're going to we're going to go through a number of risks and talk about them. And we're going to start with kind of the most important one when I think about an electronic sports event, and that is power outage. Excellent. I'm so glad you brought that up because of all the events and tournaments that can happen, power is very critical for esports and very essential. Um, I think we can break this down into really two different fronts. There's there's two concerns that you that could occur. Something that is facility or system wide where the entire event has lost power, the entire facility has lost power. And that makes it really challenging because it might be something that has to do with a problem with the facility itself or external. Some like maybe the power went out because of a storm outside. Um, and this is very challenging because you're gonna have to think about either delaying an event, rescheduling, canceling, um, having a backup location and an alternative plan. Um, you could have a generator to at least get some lights on, but that's probably not going to solve a problem if you need an internet connection, right? So that can be a major issue. Um, and speaking of kind of the system-wide, facility-wide disruptions, having some kind of wired ethernet connection to avoid any kind of Wi-Fi disruptions, that would be a preferable approach as well. But then we can look, flip and look at the more of a, a smaller scale power disruption where a particular console um, or a panel of consoles might go down. And this is something that you can plan for and be prepared. So have extra stations, have backup um, gaming devices, uh, power strip outlets, extension cords, LED screens if you're having this um, being watched by a live audience. Having someone there who their responsibility is to correct any of these problems um, if they do occur, because we're talking about the need for a lot of power to power all these devices, and it's possible that you may lose power to the equipment, and that would be um, a critical problem in esports. You know, Angela, what's interesting to me is that back in the, in the day, we always had to make sure we had flashlights and lanterns, but now everyone has a, an iPhone and they have a flashlight on their phone or they have another type of phone. And, you know, so at least we know that attendees will be able to um, maneuver and, and get around uh, with some light. Um, That's a great point. They can help you provide some temporary lighting to at least evacuate the, the facility, evacuate the location. <laughs> sure, because, you know, there could be a need to evacuate because if you lose power and you lose the internet and you can no longer um, hold the event and you have a large event, for example, you may need to orderly get everyone to orderly leave the facility. So part of your risk management plan will have to be evacuating people in the event that there is a power outage and you don't want to have people trampling e each other. So, you know, that everyone has their phone light on, you have, you have your exit signs in compliance with fire codes and people can be led out 
in an orderly fashion. So you probably want to tell people about how, how to do that. Yes, absolutely. Great. That's a great um, point. We need to have a communication plan, what the message is going to be, and your staff that are helping support the event or volunteers that are there, they need to know what that plan is as well and how to communicate that in a, in a reasonable fashion. We don't want to induce panic. Um, often a power outage is in a panic type situation, um, but we do want people to safely get to a, a well-lit location. And we'll talk a little bit more about how you evacuate when, when we're talking about fire. That's our next topic. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and fire is a reason why you, people may need to evacuate more quickly than just having a simple power outage. But protecting people is the number one priority and, and should be the number one goal and focus. So getting people out in a safe, orderly fashion, having a great communication plan, um, informing the fire department that your event is happening or um, you know, knowing what the, the fire plan is for that facility can be very important, having that conversation. Um, where the nearest exit routes are, are located. If one um, exit is, is blocked, how do you um, get people out in a safe and efficient manner? Um, and then we have to think about protecting property too. There's a lot of expensive equipment that goes into hosting um, an esports tournament. And you have to think about that money that is um, in the facility as well. There might be merchandise or other um, equipment there. Um, so try to, to try to protect that. That should be a secondary focus to try and preserve property as, as best as possible. Um, the last piece really thinking about with fire is looking at business continuity. How do we keep our business going? How do we keep our operations going? How do we maybe finish the event or conclude the event in a reasonable fashion? Those are also things to think about. Catherine, no, what do you what do you think about that? <laughs> okay, so one thing that um, most commercial facilities have are fire protection systems, which include sprinklers. And sprinklers cause water damage. So we're not only talking about fire damage, but we're also, when we talk about fire, we're also talking about water damage. Because even if you didn't have um, a fire protection system, which was sprinklers, you would have firefighters that might spray water into the facility. And you know what's interesting to me is I think about, when I think about protecting property, I think about everyone grabbing their, um, the hardware. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I think about like, if you're on an airplane and you, and there's an evacuation and you're going down the slide and you're bringing your luggage with you, I can kind of see people like trying to evacuate in haste, carrying large computer equipment. So, uh, you know, usually you just need to protect yourself and, and get out of there. And uh, so perhaps announcements should say, leave your computer behind, just come, you know, evacuate. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that could cause, quite frankly, a trip hazard if there's um, plugs that are, you know, being kind of pulled and, <laughs> um, you know, they, those can create a, create a trip hazard, um, can create, um, a problem in evacuating. Um, hopefully all the equipment is insured. So getting people out and getting people out safely should be the priority and the equipment, the equipment is replaceable, right? So that should be a secondary, secondary priority. Sure. Absolutely. Now we'll move on to weather risks. Okay, so if you turn on the news, if you're not watching about Ukraine right now, you're watching about a tornado that has been wreaking havoc in Texas and other states. So one weather risk of concern is tornado, um, <clears throat> hurricanes, heavy rains, flooding, earthquakes, tsunami, heat, snow, ice. It really depends on your location. and. Um, unfortunately, you know, there are certain areas of the country and of the world that experience, you know, they have a high risk of some of these. And in Hawaii, we have hurricane risk, tsunami risk, earthquake risk, and heat. And in other places, snow and ice are an issue, heavy rains, flooding, another issue that we have here. Um, but everywhere has their own risk. And any 
any um, event organizer should um, look at, assess those risks and be aware of what risks could occur. And they should look at the impact on attendance, whether attendees can safely attend the event. I mean, can they drive there? Can they, you know, are they going to be able to do so safely? Maybe the weather event is not expected until during your event or not expected until the, they're driving home from the event. All of those need to be considered. Can they access the venue? And then we talked about power outage. With a lot of these weather events, there's a risk of power outage. So you add another component to it and you have that risk of people, property, and business. So you should be aware of weather forecasts by paying attention. And even if your event is inside, don't think that the fact that there's gonna be lightning might possibly impact your event or don't think that the possibility that there's heavy rain or snow might impact your event. You may need to provide appropriate warnings to attendees about that. And you might need to warn them of any possible challenges like ice and snow. Um, so you'll need to take action to make your event safe in light of the weather issues. You may need to be putting up warning cones because there's water that accumulates that could call, cause slip and falls. There could be issues of parking lot safety. You may have to clear paths of snow and ice. You also have to be willing to cancel an event or postpone an event in, in light of severe weather. Uh, and you should have an emergency plan in place in case there's a weather issue during your event. Uh, you, have to make to, you might have to make decisions about whether to evacuate or shelter in place. If you shelter in place, you may have to have provisions for those people sheltering. Um, so any thoughts on that, Angela? I, I think you covered a, a wide range of, of recommendations. I would add that it's possible, if it's possible to adjust the time of your event, the start or the finish, then that, that's also maybe a good choice as well. Sometimes rescheduling for another day might, might cause a significant disruption, but an adjustment by an hour or two really can make a big difference where weather won't disrupt your event. And going back to the power outage piece, you, you certainly don't want um, weather adversely impacting your ability to access power for, for your event. Sure. And, uh, you know, we, we mentioned that parking lot, and that's a good segue into human actions. Absolutely. So there are so many things and so many ways that human behavior impacts the events and creates risk. Um, and sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's unintentional behavior. But I think we should talk about violence because violence is an issue The specifically there's an incident that happened involving an active shooter at an esports competition um, in an event in Jacksonville, Florida in 2018, where a gunman came to an esports competition um, that was held at a riverfront pizzeria restaurant. There were professional competitors competing for prizes in this online streamed event. It was a regional qualifier for an event in Las Vegas. Um, so basically an active shooter opened fire, killed two competitors, nine others uh, suffered from gunshot wounds, and two more were injured fleeing the area. So this active shooter situation has uh, unfortunately extended into the esports gaming community. Um, so Electronic Arts was uh, basically issued a statement in response to the shooting, and they are the software publisher who, um, behind the Madden football video game series, they were sponsoring the game's competitive circuit. Um, they canceled the remaining qualifying tournaments, and their CEO basically said that they would run a comprehensive review of safety protocols for competitors and spectators, um, look for a consistent level of security being provided, at all of their competitive gaming events. And I think that's an important lesson for 
uh, all events to to carry forward in in thinking about active shooters as a possibility, especially since um, the gamers they're focused on their 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 devices, their consoles, and they're looking at their com their computer screens and everybody's focused on that. They're not focused on the who else is in the room and what else the other people are doing in that space. So someone else should be kind of monitoring that situation. Um, for the larger events, I think you certainly want to think about providing some kind of security. You may even want to do some kind of screening like uh, metal detector screening um, as people are entering the venue, particularly spectators that don't have a reason to necessarily necessarily bring in um, anything, any of the devices, um, but providing that kind of security and protocols would be go a long way. But the other area we should be thinking about is fighting. <laughs> I know a lot of trash talking is really popular in esports, um, but fighting is a very real um, uh, outcome between competitors, between fans. And I know bad behavior really violates esports e code of conduct and most platforms community rules. Um, but that is a that is a reality of the situation that this is an issue we have to be mindful of. And a lot of these events can be be intimate, where people are in close proximity to one another. Um, emotions are intense. Um, and some of these events are larger scale. So providing venue security, and that could even extend into the parking lot as well. So having those protocols in place. Um, Catherine, is there anything you wanted to add about the violence aspect of, of human actions? You know, fortunately, esports doesn't really have the culture of people fighting in the, in, in the arena, like in things like soccer, you know? <laughs> I mean, you see worldwide, you know, uh, soccer or football matches where people are fighting, they set fire to the stands, they run onto the field and all this stuff. We haven't really seen that yet with esports, but esports is pretty young. And, and as people become more passionate about their teams, then, you know, it's possible that there could, you know, those kind of things should happen. But, you know, when you're, um, developing your risk management plan, it's always a good idea to consider the possibility. So at least you've, you know, thought about what you're going to do in that situation. Exactly. That's exactly right. We should always be looking to what other, what's happening at other events and other venues, um, locally, nationally, internationally, and we should be, be using them as a model to kind of inform our best practices for risk management strategies and decisions. The other aspect of human behavior that should be considered are accidents. These are not intentional. Um, it, people trip and fall, injuries. These are things to, to think about, you know, and then one other aspect. So basically the, your design of where you place equipment, uh, how you do the layout of the facility, um, distancing between people, People, um, things like that can be uh, helpful to mitigate any kind of trip and fall injuries. But um, we have to also think about the the gamers are really spending a lot of time on their devices, and they are often. Um, it may be subject to kind of carpal tunnel syndrome, repetitive strain injury, back pains. So elite players spend a lot of time and in particular seated positions. And so um, on their devices also, you know, something else that's really interesting and unique to esports um, that competitors that when they're in really an intense play can actually suffer collapsed lungs from holding their breath during really intense moments of play. So maybe a warning to players, remember to breathe, <laughs> you know, maybe pay attention to um, make sure they're, they're putting oxygen back into their body. Um, so just kind of reminders like that they need to breathe and don't hold their breath, but also providing good like ergonomic setups for when they're, they're sitting in their, their chairs and they're um, playing esports, um, That's a really important piece as well. Uh, so that's something to consider. And then of course the amount of screen time, right? So how much screen time there's the, the fatigue that can happen with um, being in front of a screen for a long period of time. So really thinking through that kind of ergonomic piece, I think is very helpful. 
Yeah, the human actions piece is really big here. It has so many components. And, um, you know, it's funny because not really funny, but um, it's interesting that for a lot of events, there would be an ambulance on scene. However, a lot of sporting events, you wouldn't have that in esports. So you don't, you have to, you would actually have to make that decision to call 911 if you have, you know, someone collapse or something like that. And, you know, because it isn't that common, there would probably be, uh, you know, a, more of a lag time of making that decision, I would think. So it's something to think about. So the next topic is theft and tampering. And, you know, clearly, you know, there's a concern about um, theft of equipment, uh, tampering. Uh, you might want to put serial numbers on the equipment. You might want to photograph and catalog them. You may need to do that for your property insurance anyway. And you may, you know, you may consider security in events um, because not only you need security for your event, if it's a large event, um, for, you know, to deal with these kind of issues that we've just addressed, but also security in terms of, you know, equipment that you have, expensive equipment there, and you may want to have security cameras as well. Um, one thing important with the theft and, and um, tampering piece is a culture of honesty and integrity, having rules and enforcement of rules. Um, there is a concern about content and streaming piracy. Um, that isn't as... I mean, that's certainly something that can occur in events, but that's a really big issue if you're a publisher. And, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of time, I think I'm going to skip that and move on to cyber attacks and talk a little bit more about cyber attacks because cyber attacks are, are super uh, a big concern if you have an event. I mean, hackers look to are looking to profit from esports. They'll target vulnerable vulnerable players. They'll push targeted malware. They'll launch um, DDO, DDoS attacks or distributed and denial of service attacks against tournaments, and a lot more. So, and you know, right now we have a big concern about cyber attacks because of. The war in Ukraine, and you know, uh, famously, the Russians have threatened cyber attacks, and so that's something that has to be, you know, we have to be concerned about. Um, and then, you know, that goes along with well, one thing that I'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about insurance is cyber insurance and the need. But I, I happened to watch a cyber insurance webinar this morning, and. It did occur to me that when you get an, a cyber insurance policy that they do have a lot of requirements before you can get that policy. And pay, those requirements are pretty much risk management requirements. And so frankly, I think your cyber insurer can provide a lot of risk management guidelines to you in terms of how you should um, address that, okay? And then moving on to war and terrorism. Okay, as, as um, I mentioned with the Ukraine-Russia war right now, war and terrorism is at the top of our minds. And these things have to be paid attention to. And right now, for the United States, the issue is more the cyber security piece. However, if you're in Poland, if you're in a NATO country, if you're in even a you know a country that might be non-NATO NATO, but be close to the action, you know you have to be concerned about these kind of threats. Um, so you know that's something that you pay attention to, um, and you know a lot of insurance policies have exclusions for war and terrorism. So you do want to know what your policy covers. And now let's move on to 
COVID-19, something that we want to be over with. <laughs> yeah, I think I think most of us probably know the best practices for COVID-19, but just kind of think about how do you best prepare for um, situations where you want to avoid people getting sick, um, you monitor the circumstances, monitor the situation, you may have to make changes, pivot, um, and then just be diligent in enforcing those procedures, maybe distancing between consoles, um, between players, hand sanitizer, you know, testing, just be flexible, think about how you can pivot in that situation. And then I would sort of go into the social distancing aspect, you know, maybe is it reasonable to have a facility where, um, so the, the next the next slide here, he talks about the social distancing piece, like, should we keep people separated? Should we have them close together? Maybe if they're not facing each other, maybe it's okay to um, have them seated next to each other, but not across from one another. Um, and that kind of leads me into the transportation piece because people need to come to these events, right? And go home from these events. A lot, some people are traveling as teams. Um, recently, there was a golf team that was traveling. And um, unfortunately, uh, the coach and uh, the golfers were killed in a car accident. And this just really reminds us that it's important to think about transportation and how that can be a risk, particularly if uh, a coach is, is driving um, uh, an entire team. So should entire teams travel together? Can you get a third party contractor, like a, a bus with a dedicated drive professional driver, um, you know, that will shift some liability away from your organization. And then the coach can really work on being responsible for those in the bus and maybe keeping them from distracting the driver in that environment. And if people are going to be transporting other teammates or family, you know, if parents and friends are driving other teammates, you know, maybe you want policies, procedures, releases and permissions for them to be driven by other people as well. That could be something to consider as well. Speaking about releases, let's look at liability waiver. Okay, so uh, I'm sure many of you have uh, signed a liability waiver. Um, it, it serves as a defense uh, to a lawsuit. It doesn't mean that you, if you signed one that, um, or if you have people sign it, if you're an event organizer, that it won't make it so you're not sued. It just means that, that you might be able to get out of the lawsuit by filing a motion for a summary judgment and having it dismissed. Um, liability waivers have to comply with local um, laws of your jurisdiction or the jurisdiction where the event is held or whatever jurisdiction is selected. So you can't just pick a liability waiver off of the internet. I draft them all the time for people and you know it depends on their, their um, particular um, uh, jurisdiction, what the laws are, okay? And uh, can we show that slide again, please? Um, and so um, you want to make sure it's clearly worded and unambiguous, and that by signing, basically, um, the, the participant is um, assuming the risk, okay? Yeah, and I think it's interesting to go back to the active shooter that happened in Jacksonville, Florida, and that event was was it didn't have a, they didn't have a permit to actually operate that type of event in that facility. So, you know, when you're talking about a waiver or even when we're talking about insurance, if you're not actually following the local rules and you're holding an event that doesn't have the proper permit, that could be a problem. So that's not necessarily going to save you if you aren't following the rules of the local jurisdiction. Absolutely. And, you know, I will point out that electronically signed waivers are legally enforceable, um, and that seems to be a common way now. Let's move up to the insurance piece um, and show that. Okay, so when it, we keep talking about insurance, insurance is basically risk financing. It's transferring the risk, the financial risk to another company, which is the insurer. And you'll want to buy general liability insurance, property insurance, cyber uh, security insurance, and there may be other insurance um, you know, packages that you might want to get. You need to talk to a broker, a professional to advise you on that. Um, anyway, it was fantastic discussing with uh, this with you, Angela.
Yeah, absolutely, Catherine. I've really enjoyed it. And I, there is just one more piece that I want to impart on you, the audience is that um, these video games do have copyright protection and you do have to have permission to actually um, use those in public tournaments. So that's another way to avoid some risk. But thank you for um, allowing me to be part of this conversation. And I hope everyone can avoid having these challenges at their venues and during their competitions. All right, fantastic. And you can find us at norsports.com and uh, um, you know, contact us if you have any questions regarding sports risk management or esports risk management. And thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Next week, my guest will be Ryan Sia to talk about Rake Tectonic Pro, the world's first uh, force pad and keyboard set. See you then. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.